Hello, this is Donald, the little bitch Trump. I was president, but now I'm not because I'm a loser and a traitor and a coward. Rise of the Rulers uses Trademarks and or copyrights owned by Pezo Incorporated, used under Pezo's community use policy at pezo.com slash community use. We are expressly prohibited from charging you to use or access this content. Rise of the Rulers is not published, endorsed, or specifically approved by Pezo. For more information about Pezo Incorporated and Pezo products, visit pezo.com. And if you don't want to hear my reptilian and dishonorable voice again, send a community use policy to ruler to e at gmail.com. I lost the election fair. And square snowflakes. Fart. Now I have a tentacle cannon. Ho, ho, ho. It's time for a special holiday edition of Rise of the Rule Lords. So the holidays have passed, but you have seen all of your friends getting beginner boxes and Pathfinder 2E core rulebooks, and you've decided, hey, I want to get into this game too, but where do I start? I'm here to give you that introduction into your journey into Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Who am I? Well, I'm just your hortive and judicious rule lord, Pete. I actually see this question all the time, both on the Pathfinder 2nd Edition subreddit as well as Twitter. People are ready to play Pathfinder 2nd Edition, they're just not sure where to start, both as players and GMs. Well, as my dwindling bank account would suggest, I have a good deal of experience with the various products for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. This episode is going to be sort of a buyer's guide into where to put your money, if you even need to, to get involved in the game. All of this is going to be separate from the reasons why you should play Pathfinder 2nd Edition or an introduction into actually playing the game. I already have episodes about that. Rather, I'm going to be going over the various products that Paizo and some third-party publishers offer to make your game more fun. Some of these you might consider to be essential, and some of them less so. I'm here to help you make your own decision into which you consider to be which. Players will have different demands than Game Masters. And during these tough economic times, we all have to be a little bit more careful into where we invest our hard-earned money. If you want to be extremely financially unstable, <laughs> like yours truly, you could go out and get everything willy-nilly. But many of us are not in the place to be able to make that jump. Rather, I hope that this guide will help you space out your purchases, even if you want to collect everything. By the end of this podcast episode, you should be able to prioritize which purchases you want to make and when, and also decide if you need to make that purchase at all. So without further ado, let's get started. Now the obvious first question is, what should I get first? Where should I go to? What resources should I look up? Who should I watch or listen to get more into this game? Whenever this question comes up, I usually see the same couple of answers. The Beginner's Box, Archives of Nethys, popular channels like How It's Played or The Rules Lawyer might be recommended, and even the kind benevolent stranger might even suggest this very podcast. However, if we're talking about your very first step into Pathfinder 2nd Edition, a place to go to see if you even want to dip your toes into this system. Something at no cost. Something that will still give you a taste of the Pathfinder 2e experience. For that, my first recommendation is the Pathfinder Primer, which you can find on Pathfinder Nexus, run by Demiplane. I'm going to talk about Pathfinder Nexus a lot in this episode, and I want to start off by saying I am not sponsored by them. I have received no monetary compensation for bringing them up so much. I would love to be sponsored by them, but I'm not. This recommendation, as well as all others, is provided completely free of any kind of compensation from those publishers, including Paizo. 
This is just for your benefit, and the Pathfinder Primer, I believe, is actually the first perfect step into the system. If you've played a larger, more notorious tabletop roleplay fantasy game, you might know that they have a document of free basic rules. That's basically what the Pathfinder Primer is too. It's a much scaled down version of the same material that you'll find in the core rulebook. There's a sampling of ancestries, classes, as well as skills, feet, equipment, and spells. But this is basically a free version of the core rulebook with art, Galarian specific information, as well as the Pathfinder 2e templating. This 11 chapter booklet is far more digestible than having the big old core rulebook slapped down in front of you. However, you can still use it exactly like you would if the core cool rulebook was put in front of you. Has some basic classes, the cleric, fighter, rogue, and wizard, the same classes that you'll find in the Pathfinder beginner's box, as well as some common fantasy ancestries like the dwarf, elf, human, and Paizo special goblin ancestry. If you're fine with just those character choices, you can use the primer to play a character all the way up to level 20. So essentially, you would never have to buy the core rulebook at all. You would have to be fine with the limited number of options compared to buying the full core rulebook, but it is just as usable. If you can follow the Pathfinder Primer, you can play Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Simple as that. Going on from the Primer to purchase more resources from Paizo or third-party products will only increase your experience with Pathfinder 2nd Edition, but you can still get a full and complete experience just from this resource. Now, if you do decide to continue on your Pathfinder 2nd Edition journey, this is a good opportunity where I want you to consider what kind of player or GM you are. That's not so much in terms of gameplay style, but how you like to consume your media about the game. Are you someone who enjoys physical products? Are you someone who would rather have all their assets as digital files? Are you going to be playing the game in person or online? This choice here is what's going to impact your purchasing decisions moving forward. There are five separate ways to digest the core rulebook alone. So determining for yourself how you like to enjoy this media is going to help you a lot. But even before we get into buying anything, there's a resource that you should have favorited on your desktop, whether you're playing online or in person, whether you like books or PDFs or virtual documents, and that's the Archives of Nethys. This is by far the most popular resource that is ever brought up when talking about getting in to Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and there's a very good reason for that. Archives of Nethys is Paizo's official SRD, which stands for System Reference Document. Because Paizo utilizes the first version of the open game license, they publish all of their mechanics online for free through the Archives of Nethys. Now what does that mean? It means that every single mechanical rule for the game is available for you to look at without buying a single book. Every single feat, spell, piece of equipment, character option that you have available is on the Archives of Nethys, so you can use it entirely to figure out what kind of character you want to play. It has all the rules for class advancement. It has every single archetype, every skill, every spell, Every single thing that you need to play Pathfinder 2nd Edition is on the Archives of Nethys. It really can't be understated just how valuable of a resource the Archives of Nethys is. It's also extremely unique to Paizo. That said, there are a couple things that you're going to be missing out of from the Archives of Nethys. You're not going to get Paizo's trade dress, which maybe that doesn't matter to you. That's the kind of fonts that they use, where they place stuff in their books, the artwork that they have. You're not going to get any of that. There is some artwork that they're allowed to utilize, but the big, beautiful pictures that you'll see at the start of chapters, that kind of stuff is absent. You're also not going to get anything specific to the Galarian lore that Paizo utilizes for its Pathfinder 2nd Edition setting. 
While Archives of Nethys will still post the mechanics that you can find in the Lost Omens line, Paizo's version of its settings books, you're not going to get things like lore, deities, information about societies, lands, anything like that. For homebrewers, that probably doesn't matter a whole lot. But there are many people, even when they're running their own campaigns, that like to set their games in the Galarian setting, just because it has so much rich lore to it. And you're also not going to get specific adventures from Archives of Nethys. Paizo is pretty famous for its writing, especially for its adventures, such as the adventure paths and modules that they sell. However, information about those is specifically restricted to those adventures, except for, again, any mechanical things that are added to the game, like archetypes specific to those adventures, unique monsters, etc. So, many people can get a full experience for Pathfinder 2nd Edition just from utilizing the Archives of Nethys to access the mechanical rules. But I think you're missing out a lot from not going into the books themselves. So now we're finally going to talk about the first bit of actual purchasing to do to get into Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Now there are two distinct paths that you could take at this juncture. One is that you could go right for the core rulebook. The core rulebook itself has everything that you need to play Pathfinder 2nd Edition, save for monsters. There are enough class options, ancestry options, spells, pieces of equipment to be able to comfortably play 2nd edition without ever opening another book. More experienced players and game masters from other systems might feel pretty comfortable taking this route, but there is arguably one product to get before even jumping into the core rulebook, and that's the Pathfinder 2e Beginner's Box. The Beginner's Box is a trove of stuff to get you right into playing the game. If you get the physical box, you will get both a player's and game master booklet. Much like the Pathfinder Primer that I talked about, these are condensed rules that are the same as what you would get from the core rulebook. It's a limited number of options, but they're the same kind of options that you would get from the core rulebook. But in the game master section, there is also an introductory adventure able to take you through two distinct levels of a dungeon crawl and get your players to second level. What makes this adventure so highly recommended among Pathfinder 2e players is that it's uniquely written to introduce the mechanics of second edition gradually to players. Many first level adventures are going to get you right into the fun of second edition, but the beginner's box is going to step players into the various modes of play, from combat, to using skills, to exploration mode, to puzzles. Players don't even need to come up with their own character if you're just trying to get your friends into playing 2nd edition with you. The beginner's box comes with four pre-generated characters, a rogue, a fighter, a wizard, and a cleric. These are classic classes that will nevertheless give you a broad spectrum of the modes of play to second edition. The fighter will be great in combat, the rogue will be great at skills, the wizard will be great at magic, and the cleric will be great at healing. The box also comes with color-coded dice that correspond with the abilities on those pre-written character sheets. If a player needs to roll an 8-sided die, the character sheet is going to show the color-coded die that corresponds with the physical dice in front of them. That way, even if they're unfamiliar with the sides, they can always find the right dice. The beginner box also comes with a nice little cheat sheet card that has different kinds of actions and describes how the three action economy works in the game. It also lists some of the conditions that the players are likely to encounter during this adventure. And again, if you're running the physical box, it doesn't just give you the information to run the adventure, it gives you the equipment as well, including maps and tokens. Essentially, the beginner's box gives you every single thing that you would need to get right into playing 2nd edition. Both the player's guide and the game master guide 
also have additional options so just in case you don't feel like using the pregen or running the written adventure, you can make up your own characters or make up your own adventure using the resources that are already in the box for you, including tokens for all of those extra monsters. A notable thing about this beginner's box is that it doesn't just come in the physical version, it comes in a virtual one as well. The three major virtual tabletop platforms, Roll20, Fantasy Grounds, and Foundry Virtual Tabletop all have digital versions of the beginner's box. They are made with all of the assets, including the adventure, installed so that all you have to do is plug it into your system of choice and get right into playing it. I particularly recommend the Foundry Virtual Tabletop version, which also comes with sound, dynamic lighting, and even overlapping setting materials so that it looks like your players are going underneath portions of the cave or underneath beams that are in a basement. Now remember earlier how I said you need to figure out what kind of player or GM you are? This is where you need to make that critical decision. You will get the same materials in both versions of the beginner's box, whether it's physical or virtual. You'll get a little bit more of an enhanced experience with the virtual version because of the bells and the whistles that it adds, but is that the kind of game that you want to run? I love being at a table. There is no substitute to me for the energy that you get when players are there rolling natural click clack rocks. But I also have friends spread all across the country, in which case having a virtual way to play this game is essential. You should figure out how you want to play this game and then get that version of the beginner's box. I can't say which is better, because again, better is really defined on what you get your enjoyment from. Just being able to play with a lot of friends or sitting there at a table with them. But with either medium, there is no substitute for the beginner's box for being able to get right into playing Pathfinder with everything that you need to jump into it. So now you've gotten to play the beginner's box, you're impressed with the classes, you had a lot of fun, and you're ready to go right into it. Well then, now is the time when we get the core rulebook. I'm not going to go too much into why the core rulebook is so essential. I mean, it's right there in the name. It has tons of classes, tons of spells, tons of feats, tons of equipment. It's everything that you need to play Pathfinder. Everything that you need besides monsters. If there is one thing that should be on your shelf to play this game, it's the core rulebook. What I am going to talk about, though, is the medium that you use to digest it. Like I said, there are five distinct ways to enjoy the core rulebook. The first and most common way is the core rulebook that you can find at virtually any friendly local game store. It's big, it's hardcover, it has this cool picture of a dragon blowing flames at a couple of the Pathfinder 2E Iconics. At any game that you go to, someone is surely going to have this version of the core rulebook on them. That said, it is a little big and a little bit heavy because, again, this has everything. Pathfinder doesn't break it up by a player handbook and a GM handbook. It is all in one single book. That can make it a little intimidating to just plop in front of players, but it is what it is. But if the sheer size of the core rulebook daunts you, there's another way to ingest it, which is the pocket edition of the core rulebook. These are smaller paperback versions that are much smaller, but contain the exact same information. They weigh less, they take up less shelf space, and they are cheaper than getting the hardcover version. Paizo sells the pocket editions of all of their core materials. So far, their Lost Omens line, even the big bulky setting books like the Mwangi Expanse or Impossible Lands have not been made into pocket editions. But all of their core books, the ones that have the majority of rules and new classes especially, those are going to be found in pocket editions as well as hardcover. If you're a shelf snob like me, they also sell deluxe versions of these books. Deluxe versions are a little bit more expensive, but have a faux leather cover with embossed 
glossy, metallic-looking text on the front, but contains the exact same information as both the hardcover and softcover versions of those books. It is purely just a fancier version of that same book. But for me, as someone who likes to have stuff on display as well as accessible information, it's a worthwhile purchase for myself. That said, every special edition is first print only, which means that as errata is added, new printed versions of the core rulebooks will come out, but never in the deluxe version package. In fact, I did a super extra thing where I went to a book coverer and had them replace the insides of a more up-to-date core rulebook into the cover version of a more deluxe core rulebook because I'm just that kind of person. Uh, and as far as I know, that is the only core rulebook that has up-to-date printing of the rules. But I digress. If having a physical version of the book doesn't work for you, they also offer two distinct digital versions. The first is the PDF version, which is always cheaper than either the hardcover or the softcover versions. Again, word for word, font for font, picture for picture, artwork for artwork, everything is going to be the same in the PDF as it would be if you had the physical book. Now, I'm not a huge fan of PDFs, mostly because of the formatting which is to say that you are looking at it like it's a document, which means that it is not very friendly for phones. Because I am a GM, sometimes on the go to conventions or playing at my friendly local game store, if I want the PDF version, I kind of have to argue with the electronic tool of my choice to be able to look at the PDF. I've not had great success with PDF readers on tablets, and on phones it's basically impossible because you have to zoom in and then scroll left to right to be able to read anything at all. But for some people, that's just fine, especially if they're always playing on a desktop and they can just zoom into what they need. PDF can also be helpful because you can use Control F to find what you need really easily. By far though, I think the best way to digitally consume the core rulebook word for word, text to text, font for font, is with Pathfinder Nexus. Like with the primer, you're going to get all of the formatting, artwork, as well as the Galarian specific information in the Nexus format of that book. The only thing that you really lose out on Nexus is the borders of each page. However, the layout of everything that's in a normal book or PDF is placed in the same way on Nexus. But the benefit of Nexus compared to using a PDF is that Nexus works great on multiple forms of electronic devices. If you'd use desktop, great, it works there. If you use a tablet, great, it works on that too. And even on mobile, it moves the text so that you can read it just perfectly on a mobile device. The other thing that I love about Nexus resources is that they have links within the text. The PDFs sometimes have hyperlinks, but never to other sections of the PDF besides what is there in the table of contents section. In Pathfinder Nexus, certain words are going to have hyperlinks, which you can just hover over to be able to get a little pop out with that rule. So a specific spell or piece of equipment, you don't have to jump to another section of the book. You can just read it right there where you are. But if you want to go to that section, you just have to click it and it takes you right to it. It has all the benefits of being a website while also maintaining everything that you love about the actual book compared to using something like Archives of Nethys. Now it's worth bringing up the unique relationship that PDFs have with Pathfinder Nexus. There are a number of different ways to get PDFs for cheap from Paizo. You can always make one-off purchases that work with sales that Paizo occasionally has. Paizo also frequently partners with Humble Bundle, selling these incredible deals of tons of different PDFs for an extremely low price, literally pennies on the dollar. You might also have a Paizo subscription, 
which gives you both the physical product as well as a complementary version of the PDF. Subscriptions are particularly cool because you will often get the physical product before it goes live on shelves, which gives you a tiny bit of bragging rights with your friends when you're able to talk about this book that they're not even able to buy themselves. But no matter how you get the PDF, if you own a copy of the PDF through Paizo, you can connect your Paizo account with Pathfinder Nexus and get an extremely reduced price on Pathfinder Nexus materials for owning that PDF. While Nexus materials sell at the MSRP of an actual physical core rulebook, having the PDF connected with your account can reduce the price as much as I believe 60 to 70% off. That in conjunctions with sales that Nexus also has, as well as this bundle deal that Nexus has, can make it very cheap to acquire the same materials on Nexus as the PDF that you already own. Now of course, that brings up why would I bother getting Nexus when I already have the PDF, or sometimes even the PDF and physical copy of the book. Again, this just comes to a preference of how you choose to digest the materials. I really can't speak highly enough about the display of Pathfinder Nexus compared to a PDF version of it. Even having the book, in my view, doesn't compare at all to the Pathfinder Nexus version of that same book. I would easily, easily recommend the extra purchase on Pathfinder Nexus. But again, it's your choice. It is, after all, paying extra money for materials that you already own. So it's a question of, are you okay with digesting the materials in the book or the PDF form? Or do you want to pay a little bit more to have an enhanced experience? That is a choice entirely dependent on you and your own financial situation. But those are the various mediums for which you can purchase Paizo materials. So now that you have the core rulebook, what's next? Well, there are several good options, but my next suggestion might surprise you a little bit. The book I would recommend getting after the core rulebook, which is good for players and GMs alike, is Book of the Dead. Of all the other resources that I'm going to talk about that Paizo offers, Book of the Dead is a particularly unique one. As the name might suggest, it covers the undead of Galarian. It's unique in that not only does it have lore about the Galarian aspect of the undead, such as the various lands of the dead, the mysteries of the unlife, hunters of the dead, but it also provides resources for both players and game masters at the same time. While Book of the Dead is unique in that it doesn't offer any new classes, it does give players new backgrounds, new ancestries, and new archetypes. This plethora of player options makes it a perfect extra compendium on top of the core rulebook. For game masters though, it's also an extra bestiary. A bestiary is a book of monsters, and the Book of the Dead has a lot of them. These are various unique undead creatures that players can start to fight, meaning that you can use just this book to be able to give your players more options as well as run entire campaigns with. On top of that though, it also has a unique adventure within the book. This is the first and so far only time that a core book of the Pathfinder series has had an adventure within the book. The adventure called March of the Dead starts at third level, meaning that you could run the beginner's box, play a little bit of your own homebrewed version of Pathfinder, getting them up to second level, and then jump right into this third level adventure. So already just with two books, you are able to have whole campaigns in Pathfinder second edition for both players and game masters. After Book of the Dead, Game Masters will probably want to invest in any of the three bestiaries. Bestiary 1 is going to have the most classic kind of monsters, things that are going to come up all the time, whether it's in written campaigns or ones that you come up on your own. Trolls, giants, wolves, dragons, you know, the essentials. 
even if you're a game master who chooses to run pre-written adventures, you're going to need Bestiary 1. It is by far the most commonly sourced of all of the bestiaries. Again, just because of how many options it has and how fundamental some of these monsters are to various campaigns. Bestiary 2 adds some of the more uncommon but still classic monsters. Demons, dinosaurs, hippogriffs, things like that. But it also has far more unique creatures to Pathfinder 2nd Edition than Bestiary 1's. Things like the Zamok, the Frog Hemoth, the Desiriac. Bestiary 3 is probably my favorite, just because of how out of the box a lot of these creatures are. Bestiary 3 does a great job of incorporating non-European monsters into the fantasy setting. They worked with writers native to those areas to bring you things like the Quaddle, the Kami, the Mokla Membe. They wanted to make sure that they handled these monsters in a respectful way, and bringing in those authors was a crucial part of being able to do that. Bestiary also brings in a unique creature type, which is troops. Troops are essentially swarms of larger creatures. This can give your characters the feeling of fighting in battles against nearly impossible odds. It also lets the game master throw a ton of creatures without having to manage 24 individual stat blocks. You just get to work with the one, moving it as one large group. If you're a game master who is going to be running a lot of their own homebrew adventures, the best series are a crucial addition to your collection. Now on the player side, after the core rulebook and Book of the Dead, my next recommendation would be the advanced player's guide. This is going to take the options that you had available in the core rulebook and crank it up to 11. There are new ancestries, new classes, and new archetypes, as well as additional options for the ones that you already had from the core rulebook. The notable class additions in the Advanced Player's Guide are the Investigator, Oracle, Swashbuckler, and Witch. The Investigator class is a great one for players who want to get really invested in the story. A major battle tactic that they have is Devise a Stratagem, where if you've seen the newer Sherlock Holmes, works kind of like that scene where Robert Downey Jr. is anticipating his fight moves before he even makes them. You make a roll with a d20 and get to look at the results. Depending on what they are, you might choose to attack or you might choose to do something else if it's a pretty bad one. If it's really good and you choose to attack the creature, you get to add your intelligence modifier to your attack instead of strength or dexterity, which as an investigator, you should have a pretty high modifier with. The Oracle is a type of cursed divine spellcaster. Unlike a cleric, you get your spellcasting ability from some kind of mystery. Those mysteries give you certain benefits as well as skills, a special cantrip, revelation spells, and domains. Revelation spells are a unique focus spell to the Oracle class. These spells are very powerful, but they come with a curse. The more revelation spells you use, the more intense your particular curse gets. It's a really flavorful caster class, especially if you're the kind of player that likes the idea of actions having consequences. The Swashbuckler is a cool class because of its special ability, Panache. If you like the idea of doing cool things but not necessarily always being bound to a certain feat or rule type, this is a class for you. While there are certain swashbuckler styles that will guarantee you panache if you do something successfully like the braggart style giving you panache when you demoralize a foe, you can work with your GM to say, if I do such and so, can I get panache? Like, if I were to do an acrobatics check to swing from the rafters behind the enemy, that could grant you panache just as well. It's a class that really encourages using creativity and working with the GM rather than against them. Witches are another fun spellcasting class who get access to two really special things, familiars and hexes. In the similar vein to oracles, witches choose a patron, which grants them a spell list, a patron skill, a hex cantrip, and a granted spell. 
They also get a familiar, a very unique kind of creature that hangs around with you, gives you extra cantrips, and you get to give special abilities that can help you out outside or inside of combat. Hexes are special focus spells that you get access to through feats, and they're really fun as a spellcaster because many of them are one actions, which is something that a lot of spellcasters run up against, with so many spells being two actions, not knowing what to do with that third one. Along with other new abilities for all of the core classes, as well as extra spells and items, the Advanced Player's Guide comes with something that players love which is archetypes. Every class has a dedication, which is called multi-classing in some other games, where you might get to be an oracle and a witch at the same time, or a barbarian and an investigator at the same time. An archetype, which D&D fans might know as subclasses, come with unique feat strings that are only available to those archetypes. None of the other classes will be able to do the same things in the same way that an archetype will be able to. Archetype feats will overtake class feats that you might get on even levels, However, they're often worth it because of the special abilities that they grant them. There are also so many unique, flavorful choices. You can be a duelist, a bounty hunter, an assassin, an archaeologist, a viking, a snare crafter, a pirate, a medic, all kinds of different subclasses. With just this book and the core rulebook alone, players will have options to more class configurations than they could ever possibly play. But we can go even further with guns and gears or secrets of magic. Players often default into two kinds of groups, spellcasters or marshals. If you're a spellcaster kind of player, Secrets of Magic is the book for you. It comes with two unique classes, the Magus and Summoner, as well as tons of magic items, way more spells than you could possibly ever use, as well as new archetypes, types of items that you can use like grimoires, spell hearts, and tattoos. So just so many cool things. The Magus, or Magus, or Magus, depending on how you want to say it, is a type of martial spellcaster. You infuse a weapon with a spell, then you get to make a strike with that weapon. If the weapon hits, not only does it do the damage of the weapon type, but also the effects of the spell. The Summoner is the Pokemon trainer of the Pathfinder universe, where you get to have a special creature with you called an Eidolon, or Eldolon. Eldemon roll for combat? The Eldemon is really more of the player than the Summoner itself. You get to customize this Eidolon with all kinds of unique features, sending the Eidolon into battle while the Summoner kind of hangs back and is more support for the Eidolon than anything else. Guns and Gears is for the Marshals. For the non-Magic players, this book is for you. It not only comes with all kinds of awesome new equipment, including vehicle rules, traps, siege weapons, gadgets. Uh, it also comes with two unique classes, the Inventor and the Gunsling. The special ability of the Inventor is the equipment that they get to use all throughout the day, mainly in the form of armor, weapons, or a construct. With the weapon, you get to make something totally your own, not necessarily one of the core weapons like a hammer, Axe, but instead you get to choose various traits and basically describe it however you want to. Uh, same with armor where you have various levels of protections, regulators, speed boosters, and get to choose how that armor works. The construct is a little buddy that you get to have with you and again you get to customize it compared to like an animal companion where you just have to wait for it to grow up. You get to choose the abilities that this construct has, how it looks, and modify it over time. But regardless of the innovation that you pick, you have two cool abilities that come standard for every inventor. One is Overdrive, which is where you get to make a crafting check against your standard DC, see how much better you get to make your innovation temporarily. You also have Explode, where your thing explodes! I actually have a player who's an inventor who uses her explosion ability to have her little mechanical rabbit uh, explode healing 
on other players. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily ruin your innovation. It's just another cool mechanic to add on top of it. The other cool class is the Gunslinger, uh, which, as you can guess, gets to shoot guns. The Gunslinger especially comes with all kinds of unique archetypes with it, as well as a variety of special guns that they get to use. The special of the Gunslinger is the Gunslinger Way which is how you choose to conduct yourself with your gun. These ways give you special ways to reload as well as deeds. Deeds are special actions, reactions, and even free actions that are only available to a gunslinger who takes that particular way. This book also comes with more types of ammunition and guns than you'll find in the back of a Kentucky pickup truck. Trust me, you will not run out of ways to do big, shooty, shooty, cool things. Now let's go back to Game Masters for a second for a book that you'll enjoy. And that's one designed specifically for you, the Game Master Guide. The only reason that I didn't bring it up before is that it's not essential to play, unlike the core rulebook or bestiaries. But it is a very cool book that opens up the level of play that you're able to offer as a Game Master. The biggest mechanical, Benefits that this book will give are Variant Rules and the NPC Gallery. Variant Rules are alternate rules that you can add on top of your game without having to necessarily override too much of the core gameplay. That said, there are Variant Rules that do override core aspects of that. One of them that I really like is Stamina, which cuts the health of players in half, giving them stamina for that lost half, which is much more easily replenishable than normal healing. There's also systems like Proficiency Without Level, which makes the campaign a little bit harder, but a little bit more realistic for some GMs who like that. There's also Level Zero Characters, which gives you something to do before your players choose the classes that they want to get into. And of course, the one that everybody loves, Free Archetype, which grants your players an additional archetype on top of the ones that they would get to choose from normal play. There are also all kinds of other different variant rules that you may choose to put into your campaign or not, but they're there for you. The NPC Gallery is essentially a bestiary, but with different kinds of NPCs that players will be able to react to. So when one of your players is trying to convince the mayor to do something of a town, now you have a stat block for that politician to be able to compare it to your player's roles. The bestiaries don't really have a lot of quote unquote normal people inside of them. It's mostly a bunch of monsters. So having this NPC gallery gives you a lot of options of things to throw at players when they're in towns or cities. Now while those are the biggest mechanical benefits of this book, it really can't be understated how much of the advice of this book is essential for Game Masters. The Game Mastery chapter is going to give a lot of crucial advice both to new GMs and experienced ones about how to run games, how to build narrative, how to come up with an entire campaign from scratch. The tools chapter is going to give a game master everything that they need to know to build things that they would typically have to find from a core rulebook or adventure from the ground up. That includes building your own custom creatures, your own designs, hazards, items, worlds, artifacts. All those rules are in there for you to follow how to make a balanced Pathfinder thing. And then an introduction about subsystems, how to devise your own or how to use a couple that are already available in the Game Mastery Guide. If you want to be the greatest Game Master that ever was or will be, this is a fantastic book for you to get. The final of the available core books, since as of recording, Treasure Vault and Rage of Elements are not out, is Dark Archive. The Dark Archive is by far my favorite book, but on this list is also probably the least essential. It does come with two awesome classes for players, the Psychic and the Thaumaturge. But mechanically, besides some other archetypes on top of those classes, it doesn't have a lot to inherently add to your game. Things that you need to have at the table with you to be able to run an awesome Pathfinder campaign. That said, it is an awesome book. Let's go over why. The Psychic is a unique kind of spontaneous spellcaster who gets to use the power of their mind rather than speaking or using components to cast spells. 
you use your subconscious and conscious mind to be able to cast different spells and abilities. Unique among the psychic is the ability to unleash your psyche, where you become so overcome with the spell power or the power of your mind that you make them even more powerful, more damaging, but suffer a little bit of exhaustion from it. A Thaumaturge is the Deus Ex Machina class of Pathfinder. You know just enough or are carrying just the right materials to be able to handle just about any situation. You hoard different materials in your pockets and satchels and vials and everything until just the right time to be able to implement them. Your special ability is exploit vulnerability, where you get to know just the right thing about the kind of creature that you're facing to be able to defeat them. And that's by either exploiting their mortal weakness, the true weakness behind a creature, such as werewolves having silver as a weakness, or a personal antithesis where you're just able to pull out something that makes the creature a little bit weaker to you. It could be a holy symbol to a vampire, salt to a big sluggy thing, or whatever else you can think of. But what makes this such a cool book, especially for GMs, is how it lets you handle supernatural things in a fantasy world. Think of it, here in Earth, we have Chupacabra, which is, you know, a cryptid that no one's actually ever seen. But in Pathfinder, it's a thing you know about and you have a stat block. So how do you make the fantastical extra spooky in a world where fantasy and magic exists? This book helps you do that with stolen case files, cryptids, and secret societies. It has information and archetypes for things like mirror worlds, cults, curses, temporal anomalies, and mindscapes. If you're a fan of the supernatural, like the show Supernatural, or things like X-Files or Fringe, this is a good book for you. The two other source books that I can't really talk a ton about because they're just not out yet are Treasure Vault and Rage of Elements. Rage of Elements is going to come with the new Kinetasis class, which kind of works like a martial blaster, but it's also going to have a lot of information for game masters about the elemental world, planes, elementals, things like that. Treasure Vault is primarily going to introduce a new crafting system, which is probably going to be better than what we have now, because it's not super great. But then it's also going to introduce tons of new weapons, pieces of equipment, armor, artifacts, things like that. It's just going to be a trove of treasure. Probably definitely a good book for game masters who want to have more options of things to give out to their players or players who want to have more equipment options when building their character. But again, I can't say for sure because I haven't seen it yet. So those are everything that you would consider to be primary source books. Now for game masters, we have a crucial question to ask. What kind of game do you want to run? Are you going to come up with your own world? Or do you want it to be in Pathfinder's core setting of Galarian? And if you're fine with it being in Galarian, do you want to make your own adventure? Or do you want someone to have done all the heavy lifting for you? If you want to go 100% homebrew, you already have all the tools you need to be able to do that. But if you feel like venturing into the world of Galarian, there are two lines for you the Lost Omens line, and the Adventure Paths. Contained in both of these lines are monsters, player options, pieces of equipment that are unique to those books. So depending on the kind of homebrew campaign you're running, you could think that the source within them is essential. But realistically, if you are 100% a homebrewer, using just the core source books is going to get you as far as you need to go. That said, Galarian really is a truly awesome world to explore. It has every setting imaginable. From the barren wastelands of Nymeria, ruled by barbarians but an alien spaceship crashed into, to the wintry rule of the Baba Yaga in Irisin, to the nation of Geb, ruled by the undead, fighting an eternal war with the magic, arcane-focused nation of Nex, where the two leaders who have named these regions after themselves are basically lovers. From the Mwangi Expanse to the Impossible Lands. From the Knights of Lastwall guarding against the whispering tyrant Tarbafon to the greatest city, Absalom, home of the Pathfinder Society 
and the Starstone Citadel. There are truly endless adventures to be had in Galarian. Of the books that might be considered essential for players are the Ancestry Guide and Character Guide, both of which contain extra options for ancestries and characters. For Game Masters, you will probably get the most out of the Monsters of Myth and the Grand Bazaar. First of which is bestiary of really mythical monsters, and the second of which has just tons of extra equipment, including assistive items. Finally, if you really want to dig into Galarian, Legends, Gods and Magic, Pathfinder Society Guide, Absalom, the Mwangi Expanse, and Impossible Lands are your best friend. Any of these books is going to have enough lore as well as mechanical benefits to give you endless campaign ideas. But if you're a lazier GM like me, you're probably going to want to choose one of Paizo's adventure paths. A full adventure path ranges from three to six books. Each book can easily take between two and three months to complete. So take that into consideration as you figure out how long you want the campaign to go. There are also modules like Trouble in Otari or The Crown of the Kobold King, which are still pretty dense adventures, but only one book long, meaning you have a much better chance of completing them, especially because we know that because of life circumstances, sometimes groups die early or even at the end of a glorious campaign. There are also shorter one-shots, able to be easily completed within one or even two sessions. I can't go over all of the adventure paths, especially if you take into consideration the Pathfinder Society or modules or bounties that are out there, but very recently there was an awesome post on the Pathfinder 2e subreddit by user Diz City who provided very succinct and very accurate descriptions of each of the available adventure paths as of this recording, which I think are the best summaries that I've really seen for them, so I'm going to read them word for word. Age of Ashes is the first adventure path published by Paizo since the release of Pathfinder 2nd Edition. This is a classic fantasy heroic adventure where you get to be in a castle, see the world, fight slavers, monsters, and dragons. For D&D adventures, it's similar to Baldur's Gate, Neverwinter Nights, Elder Scrolls, or Dragon Age. Extinction Curse is another level 1 through 20 campaign where a group of circus misfits stumble their way into becoming heroes and saving the environment. It kind of feels like Fantasy Guardian of the Galaxy. As time goes on, there's less emphasis on the circus stuff and much more on the ecological disaster that is looming as the adventure goes on. It also will very much change your mind on the dead god Aridin. Agents of Edgewatch is another 1 through 20 where a bunch of cops are against criminals at the World's Fair in the big city of Absalom. It's pretty much every cop show trope thrown in there. Conspiracy, serial killers, gang wars, stakeouts, undercover operations, and drug busts. Now he correctly notes that all of these were still written while the rules were being structured and fully figured out so they can be a little bit more deadly than the other ones that we're going to go over. Abomination Vaults is Paizo's first 1 through 10, meaning only 3 book long adventure path. A small town adventurers dive into a mega dungeon, fighting or negotiating with numerous monstrous factions that exist underground, and to prevent a dangerous threat from emerging as horror and occult vibes. But if you're someone who just likes to run constant encounters, this is a great game for you. Fists of the Ruby Phoenix is the first high-level short adventure Paizo has published, starting at level 11 and going up to level 20. It's a high-level survival and martial arts competition in the far east continent of Tian Jia. The amazing race meets Shang-Chi in the Legend of Ten Rings. Not recommended for players new to the system, as it starts at such a high level. Paizo briefly went back to 1-20 to campaign with The Strength of Thousands, which is described as Hogwarts in Wakanda. Players start as freshman students in the oldest magical academy in the world, in one part of fantasy Africa. It's very roleplay heavy, with a huge cast of NPC characters. And while diplomatic and nonviolent resolutions are always encouraged, they may not always be possible. Quest for the Frozen Flame goes from 1 to 10, a primitive tribal survival in the tundra wilderness. Exploration in search of a mythical artifact while fighting off dinosaurs and other strange creatures, as vibes of the Banner Saga, 
or Monster Hunter, or even Event Horizon Zero Dawn. Outlaws of Alkenstar is a low magic 1 through 10 steampunk western action movie. Gunslinger outlaws out for revenge against those who framed them. Drink some whiskey, stick up a bank, fight the corrupt sheriff, and track down some dangerous dynamite before it blows up the whole town. Bloodlords, another 1 through 20 adventure where lawful evil conspiracies and murder abound. Rise up the ranks of power in a nation ruled by the undead. Prove your worth to the Ghost King, and go from being minions to being one of the bosses, taking down all your rivals through any means you can get away with. And then, probably the most famous on this list is Kingmaker, because it's a port from the most famous first edition adventure, which also has a well-known video game by Owlcat Games. Starting from level 1 and going all the way up to 20 again, start as adventuring pioneers. Forge a nation of your very own. Lots of kingdom management simulation interspersed with direct combat against diverse threats to your new nation. Very soon after the release of this podcast will also be Gatewalkers. This one will be much more focused on paranormal investigation, defeating alien monsters, and exploring strange realms. So that's all the published Paizo books. Now for a brief moment, let's talk about accessories after a brief little message. Hello, my name is James Beck from Eldritch Osiris Games. Eldritch Osiris Games is the first TTRPG workers co-op in history specializing in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Eldritch Osiris Games is built on the foundation of giving voices to creative authors who don't normally have a roadmap into the publishing industry. We push forward as a diverse set of voices in the company, regardless of a person's identity. Part of the foundation is equality, with every person in the staff having a say on all important decisions the company makes. Being the first TTRPG co-op, we are here to set an example that workers' equality is not only possible, but instead become the industry standard. Basically, we're a group of nerdy friends who want to publish work for people to enjoy. You can find amazing work such as the Ironclad and Symbio class, or dive into new ancestries like the Uplifted Bear. And if you're a GM, check out our amazing one-shots and bestiaries to spice up your combats and adventures. Find all of this and more on EldritchOsirisGames.com or follow us on Twitter at EldritchOsiris for constant updates. Well, I guess we should get the rules lore talking again. Paizo has many accessories, many meant to be for physical, at-the-table games. For game masters and players who primarily play on a virtual setting, you don't really have to get any of these. You might consider upping your game by getting the deluxe versions of each of the adventure paths that will eventually be released by VTT Foundry. Already Out is Abomination Vaults, which I am currently playing with and highly recommend, as well as a collection of all of the bestiary 1 through 3 tokens that you can include in any adventure. But if you're also a game master like me who really loves the energy of having someone at the table, there are a couple of very useful accessories for you. The first ones that I would say are near essential are the pawns. Now unfortunately, Paizo has decided to discontinue the pawn line, however there's enough out there to supply you forever. There are pawn sets for each of the bestiaries as well as all of the adventures up to Fist of the Ruby Phoenix. These pawns are basically every single creature in an adventure path printed out on really sturdy cardstock. The main bestiary box comes with more pawn bases than you could ever possibly use, however Paizo also sells colored ones in case you have multiple of the same pawn type and you want to differentiate them easily on your board. My next favorite accessory are hero points. Now you can easily keep track of hero points just on a character sheet, however, there's just something really cool about handing your player a token that they get to turn back into you when they want to use a hero point. Just adds a little bit of extraness to the game that I really enjoy. 
The battle cards are a line that Paizo is continuing, thank goodness, that has the stats for individual creatures on a very large card, so you don't have to have the entire bestiary book standing right next to you. You can just grab the cards of the creatures that you're about to face and have those with you. There are individual cards for each of the bestiaries, as well as NPC cards, ones for Book of the Dead, as well as special ones for Fist of the Ruby Phoenix and Abomination Books. Pathfinder maps are extraordinary quality, even if you're a Dungeons & Dragons player. There are all kinds of different terrain types that they offer already printed out and on the type of material where you can use wet erase markers on them. This can save you loads of time from having to draw your own individual maps. Unless you're one of them fancy boys that's got a TV and a table. The final big accessory that Paizo has are the Pathfinder Battle Miniatures. These are fully painted miniatures at the correct size with the correct shape of various NPCs or monsters that you'll have in your Pathfinder adventure. They don't have nearly enough minis available as they have creatures, so there's not going to be one for every single monster out there. Similarly, these are much more expensive than any pawn set that you can get. That said, you'll always get more of a rise out of your players putting a big old dragon mini on the board than a printout from a pawn of a dragon. The most important accessory that Paizo has available though are cards. The one that every single game master, whether you're virtual or live play, that you should have are the condition cards. Those list every single condition as well as all the effects therein. However, there are other useful cards like equipment cards, Spell cards, the chase cards, the NPC card deck, the hero point deck, the hero deck, all really great. The only ones I would actively discourage getting are the critical fumble and critical hit decks. These two decks provide extra bonuses if you get a fumble, meaning a nat one or a critical failure, or critical successes. The problem is they are way overpowered, especially when used against players. If you were going to utilize these decks, you should only use them against bad guys, monsters that the players are fighting against. So that means only players get to have effects from the critical hit deck and only monsters get to be impacted by the critical fumble deck. In either case though, I would just get these ones. Well, boy howdy, that is a lot of stuff. There are a lot of other cool things that Paizo offers like their own unique board games, they have stuffed animals, they have puzzles, their fiction is very, very good. And of course, things like dice, t-shirts, mugs, all those, you know, typical things, pins, people like pins now. But all that other stuff, those are the things that you're really going to want to get for your game. And of course, if what Paizo offers isn't enough for you, there's plenty of third party options out there too. New adventures, player options, monsters are being released on PathfinderInfinite.com all the time. Some of my favorite third-party options, though, include the Botanical Bestiary, which is a huge amalgamation of leshies. That's it. Just leshies. Go listen to my podcast about that if you're interested. The Battle Zoo Bestiary might as well be called Second Party because they're developed by Mark Seifter, who helped develop the Pathfinder 2nd Edition system. The Battle Zoo Bestiary was made by the community at large, but they're edited and improved by Mark Seifter as well as other freelancers. They also came up with the Dragon Ancestry as well as the Monstrous Ancestries. Roll for Combat, the parent company, spares no expense on the quality of these books. Very highly recommended. Eldridge Osiris Games is one of my favorite because I know a lot of them pretty well, but they also make really cool additions like Gunsmoke, which improves, in my opinion, the various options that you get as a gunslinger, the Adventurer's Handbook that gives you all kinds of new general and skill feats, and a project that I am personally working on called Monstrous Beasts, A Guide to Friend Them, which provides all kinds of new animal companions, and I am developing something called the Nautilus Subsystem, which lets you use Millennium Falcon-type submarines. Legendary Games has also added a lot more to their 2E repertoire, including Borakubos, the campaign setting, Latin American monsters, Asian monsters, Mythos monsters, and 
ultimate fairies with a bunch of fey monsters. So all of this might seem like a lot. I know, I've been there. Getting everything is a lot of money. I know, <laughs> I am currently there. But start off small. Get the core rulebook, if anything. Following that Game Masters, get an adventure path. Just one of them, not all of them. Just one to run with your group. Any of the monsters that aren't custom within the adventure path, you'll be able to find for free on Archives of Nethys. If you like it, get the best Yuri books. Players, if you want to have the whole bunch of options, get those books. The point is, don't dive in too hard too fast. Even if, for some reason, you miss out on the printing of an adventure path, these will always be available to you in digital format, either through PDFs or through Pathfinder Nexus. Now, I can't release this episode, <laughs> given the time that I am releasing it, without addressing a big crucial concern within the community. That's Wizards of the Coast's Open Game License 1.1, or as fellow content creator, the rules lawyer put it, Game System License 2.0. I will put the Gizmodo article in the show notes just so that you can get informed on the full situation, but basically, here's the rundown. Most TTRPG publishers work under something called the Open Gaming License 1.0a. This was set up 20-25 years ago to avoid this exact situation. Wizards of the Coast deciding that they own everything. The original OGL allowed people to publish under certain rule systems with certain names of certain creatures and not have to worry about having their money taken from their profits or Wizards of the Coast claiming that they own the game system that they developed. Wizards now is trying to change that with their newest open gaming license or at least the version that we've seen that was dated back in December. This is set up to cause a lot of problems both for Paizo, but especially third-party producers. That includes content creators, up to Critical Role, publishers like Kobold Press, even people who aren't publishing Dungeons & Dragons stuff at all, but are just using the open gaming license so that they can have certain rules included. It has a lot of people upset, and rightly so, but also worried. This has the potential to put a lot of people out of business, and thus out of a job. It could mean the end of whole game system lines, whole companies, of things that people like to play that weren't Dungeons & Dragons. Now I am no legal expert. I can't say whether Dungeons & Dragons' ability to do this is legally right. It's certainly not ethically right. That is going to be for courts to decide. But a question that I have been asked a lot is, isn't this going to affect Paizo? Should I really get into Pathfinder now with all of this looming over us? I have a long Twitter thread about this that I'll also link in the show notes, but essentially, Paizo's gonna be fine. They might not be unscathed, depending on how things roll out, but they are going to continue to exist, and so will Pathfinder 2nd Edition. They might need to make some changes to break away from the open gaming license completely, even if Wizards of the Coast decides to do nothing at all in the wake of this backlash. But if they do, Paizo has enough resources and put 2nd Edition in a good enough place where they can make a couple of changes relatively easily. I can't say the same for 1st edition or Starfinder, but 2nd edition should definitely be okay. At the very least, the books that are already out there, the books that you already own, will be fine. What Paizo has published up to this date is more than anyone could play in 10 years easily. So regardless of what happens with the open gaming license, which hopefully Wizards of the Coast will come to their senses with, it is a perfectly good time to try out this awesome system. And that's all I have to say about that. My voice is getting croggy and I can already feel the rumblings of my wallet being reminded of all of the purchases that I have made from Paizo over these last few years. But really folks, it's a great game system. Try it out. You're going to enjoy it. But until next session, don't let the rules rule you.